Great. Well, welcome, everyone. My name is Rich Lesser. I'm the CEO of uh, the Boston Consulting Group. And it's a real pleasure to be with you here this morning. If you, if you saw the crowds outside, you realize that this was quite a hot ticket. And uh, what I learned yesterday was that this was the second most uh, oversubscribed uh, panel. Uh, so, so now you may be thinking, you know, with this amazing group of uh, panelists up here and with a topic like digital transformation, how can it not be number one? And, <laughs> and the answer is that just like in his TV show, House of Cards, Kevin Spacey is used to finding a way to winning. <laughs> and, and so Kevin is the most requested session. Fortunately, he didn't have to throw any of us under a train to achieve, <laughs> to achieve that uh, status. Uh, in all seriousness, since I was with you uh, since I was here in Davos a year ago, I've been in 30 countries around the world and I've talked to I think a couple hundred CEOs. And the topic we're about to talk about now is the most consistent topic that comes up in the conversation. More than the geopolitics we'll hear about, more than any other single topic. And, and what we see in these discussions and frankly in the work we're doing is that there's three broad angles on this that, that companies around the world and across industries are wrestling with. The first is how they rewire themselves, how they rewire themselves to be able to take advantage of a digital cloud-based uh, mobile-oriented world and how they leverage advanced technologies, whether it's robotics or AI, inside, inside their operations. So it's their own internal changes. The second is how they, how they leverage the massive amounts of data out there and, and really be able to bring advanced analytics into their business, and not just bring it in in an algorithmic sense, but bring it in in a human sense, the people that have the capacity to use it, the processes and the clock speeds that they need to operate at. And then the third is how they use this digital world as a source of innovation for their customers, how they design new products, new services, and in some cases, whole new businesses that they can, that they can generate to drive growth in a world where growth is increasingly hard to find. And, and so this panel today is a fantastic group of people to give us five windows into how they see the world of digital transformation in their environments, and for several of them, in how they are interacting with, with their customers right now. Um, this, let me uh, quickly introduce them. I'll just go uh, left to right. Uh, Meg Whitman is the chairman and CEO of, um, of HP Enterprises, the new the, the, the part of HP that she'll be running. Uh, Bernard, uh, Bernard Tyson is the chairman and CEO of Kaiser Permanente, one of the leading integrated health providers in the US. Klaus Kleinfeld is the chairman and CEO of Alcoa. Uh, Jean Pascal Chiquar is the uh, chairman and CEO of Schneider Electric. And Mark Benioff uh, is, is the founder and chairman and CEO of Salesforce.com. So we just have this wonderful group of uh, panelists up here. We thought we would do this conversation in three blocks. I think the first is just to have a conversation about what digital transformation means to these leaders in the context of their businesses and what are the big bets that they're taking. Every CEO is trying to incrementally improve their operations in many areas, but what are the really big things that, that they're doing? And to really move the needle in the years ahead. The second block we'll talk about is how do you make that happen inside the institution? How do you become a digital culture? And how do you think about all the changes that need to happen? In some cases, even in, in the company structure, but certainly when it comes to organization, leadership, skills, information platforms that need to be created. And so what are the enablers to moving to a digital culture? And then the third is we want to leave some time for the questions that are on your mind, the things that, that you want to, to raise uh, with the group. So we'll leave a few minutes at the end to do that. Uh, this is a live stream discussion, so it's uh, being, uh, being broadcast to others. I think, therefore, uh, this is not a world where Chatham House rules apply. And at the same time, we, I want to encourage candor. And, and, and also, I've, as I've told our panelists, uh, we want to we have a conversation. So if people want to jump in, disagree with each other, build on each other, we'll try to make it free flowing. Uh, Klaus, I thought I would start with you sitting in the middle there, which is, you know, Alcoa is a classic you know, industrial leader in the metals world over you know, a century old, and yet digital transformation, I imagine three years ago, it would have never been thought that you'd even be sitting here on a digital <laughs> transformation panel. And I, and I just, 
Could you share how you've thought about digital transformation in the context of Alcoa and, and where are the big priorities from your end? Yes, so it's very relevant for us. I actually think it's very relevant for everybody and who believes it's not relevant hasn't really thought about it. So for us, I mean, to give you a little glimpse into, into where this plays, I mean, uh, the, there's a revolutionary change going on in 3D, 3D printing. For us, the, as a metals company, it's all about metals 3D printing and, and uh, we are catering to the aerospace industry the automotive industry, and this is very, uh, this changes the way things get done. You know, we have developed a lot of technology around it, and we are investing not just into the manufacturing part, but also into the powder, because uh, the powder is like the, the ink to, to, to metals, right? And here you're talking about regulated markets that where it's very, very important that you have a quality of powder uh, that uh, that a piece that's uniquely made, you know, is identical to the other piece that's uniquely made. So that's a challenge for the regulators who are currently investing in building a power powder plant that has three chambers uh, outside of outside of outside of Pittsburgh. So that's one big bet. You know, another big bet comes with the uh, total revolution on sensing. You know, sensors used to be, I mean, very expensive. I mean, industrial grade sensors. Today it's cheap, dirt cheap. We carry this around. Around. I mean, optical sensors that are in every camera with a resolution that was unthought of, uh, audio, audiological sensors, microphones, all this is, is allowing you to do things uh, that were not possible before. So this has a relevance in two aspects. One is we can re-equip our uh, current equipment and get many, many more data. The moment you have the data, you can do diagnostics. And the moment you have diagnostics, you can optimize. So this is irrelevant throughout the system, whether it's upstream, uh, midstream, or downstream. But it's also relevant for another big bet that we've come out uh, in, uh, in December last year, which is called the Micromill technology. Micromill is a revolutionary process that allows us to roll from the hot phase into a cold roll in 20 minutes, something that today takes 20 days, mm -hmm. right? And the, 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 to have a process like this, as you can easily imagine, requires a precision that was not possible before. With this precision, you actually get a material out there that was not that nobody could produce before. So in reality, you always were, were to say, you, you trade off formability to, to strengths. You trade off strengths to weight. Today, we can make material that has all of these three dimensions and optimizes the, these things all together. So this is really, this is really what's going on there. The, the, the biggest challenge, and I assume we're going to have another debate Debate around this for for a company that's big and 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 has a strong tradition is how do you make sure that everybody feels that there is a real revolution going on and and the way the way I'm I'm talking about it be a little bit more Schumpeter you know to to encourage people to have this gene of uh, constructive destruction you know but maybe that's something for for the next round and can you just it feels like between 3D printing on the one hand, micro mills on the other, the whole concept of the supply chain, the way you've envisioned, you know, historically has been envisioned, is, is going out the window. And, and how, how do you think of supply, when a business that's built around a supply chain that goes back decades and decades? Well, I would say everything is at question. I mean, so for instance, I mean, take a jet engine, you know, obviously a sophisticated part, always was a sophisticated part. The way this worked before, if you, if you, we were to design a new jet engine, you had to, you build a model, okay, we were doing modeling uh, together with, with the OEMs, you know, so, but then you had to decide when you wanted to put it into a test bed, if you wanted to have a piece made, you would have to basically decide on one of the alternatives. And then you decide, this is the alternative piece. I make it, now I order the tooling. The tooling takes 18 to 24 months and costs a lot of money. Then you have this one piece, put it into your test machine, then you test it, right? Today, the process, or today, and today actually for us was already two years ago because we had invested in that. We do it, we, we basically are able to um, indirect, to, uh, to do a 3D printing indirect, you know? So, so we did it out of polymer and then cast it from the polymer into the real piece in basically two weeks. So you now, you no, now don't have to invest into the tooling when you get it in two weeks. So now the cost are down, the time is substantially down, so you can say, I want to have three of those, and then I can have the three actual pieces in metal, fully functioning pieces that you put into your test bed. And by this, you can now find out, does my test bed and the simulation, is that close enough to the reality, right? So you, you're improving on two dimensions. So that's one, one example. You can also now make pieces with this that technology-wise, you would not be able to make before because there's no 
small casting technology that would, for instance, allow you to have a hollow structure in that particular spot, and the hollow structure that you would want to have air, air, air flowing through so that you can run this. I mean, in the, in the jet engine, it's all about temperature. So you want to run it. It's already running at, at a temperature that's uh, be, be higher than the melting point. And the only reason why it doesn't melt is because you build in cooling structures uh, with air, compressed air, so that it can run faster you know, and, and stand, stand a bigger heat. This is stuff that, that goes straight to the advantage of customers because you get a higher fuel efficiency and you get a lower emission if you can get things done. So in reality, it puts a lot of things at question. Almost, I, I think you almost have to say you put everything at question, which brings it back to the question of how can you get your team thinking about this. I mean, I think the biggest limiting factor today is not technology anymore. It's the, it's the humans in an organization that's not used to question. Great. And Jean-Pascal, while we're in the industrial world, in, in energy solutions and automation, you, you've really been an industrial powerhouse for quite a long time. Can you share how you see the digital transformation in, in your environment and your part of the industrial world? Well, first, I'm very excited that Klaus has a problem of power quality because I'm sure I can help him. So <laughs> probably I didn't lose my time by being sitting close to him this time. So, but oh um, God. really, Here I can do again. many things. This for is you. what old, this is what friendship looks like. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's not go into stereotypes. Please. But when, when, when uh, let, let's go for for our world, which is a world of uh, energy and automation, digitization carries huge implications. So, uh, it, it's we operate around the world with many partners integrators and we have used from the beginning I would say we've been early adopters of the platform of, uh, of Mark of Salesforce to organize that so I won't speak too much about that because I see Mark does it much better than I do but now when you look at energy and you think about it uh, invented more than one century ago very much siloed generation transmission and distribution on consumption demand uh, as we call it and all of it's very been very discoordinated on massive inefficiencies so 60% of everything we do, buildings, factories, homes, uh, are uh, consuming energy 60, 50% more than they should. A uh, grid is used at less than 50% of its capacity, an electrical grid, more than 50% of the time. If I would run my factories like this, you would, you would, you would really uh, be mad at me. So what is happening today is that we are connecting all of this from plant to plug, everything connected to the internet, uh, so that it, it generates all the adaptation uh, on all the efficiencies around the, around, the, around the line. Connectivity is not new for us. We started to connect things to the internet in 95. But the new new things is that now we connect those microsystems, a smart building, smart grid together so that they can adapt together. So in a nutshell, all products will be connected. All that data is getting aggregated. On analytics, we deploy analytics uh, to automate or to support decisions. So speak about the implications on our company. In 10 years, we had to develop to reconvert our R&D so that now our R&D is 60% software on electronics. And, and that's a lot, of, uh, a lot of people. As software, which is the other world of on analytics, our different culture, we set up an autonomous division uh, business inside Schneider, which is serving Schneider itself, but which is serving third party uh, people. Second point, which it changed dramatically for us, is the nature of the relationship with the customers. We are coming from a relationship which was projects on service on demand, right? You have a problem of power quality, I come to help you. Now it's we stay connected 24 7. So that means we can bring uh, new values, new capabilities, and, and we can bring a lot of new service. And I'll, I'll come back uh, to that. Third point, we are working with partners, and there are a lot of business, and we are still, and we want to keep working with partners, a uh, lot of business which are uh, based on intermediation. So you, you are kind of a, a wall between a customer and, and a supplier. You bring more value, and you make money of that. And those worlds tended to be divided. Now, because it's digital, we share. And, and that data is shared, and everybody is bringing the right value to that. So it's, it's opening a new way of, of, uh, of working with, with our partners. And needless to say, when we went into digitization, we knew connectivity, we knew software, but when you go into the cloud, uh, you can't do everything to, uh, alone. And, and, and the big thing for me is that this world is really prone to a lot of partnerships. So the big bets you have to, uh, to, to do is really to choose uh, your, the right partners on, uh, on, uh, on, on really 
Your success is depending on you, but also on the ecosystem you are choosing. But the biggest change in our industry is, has been our positioning. So uh, you were coming to see us for safety, reliability, quality. On, on no worries, you can still come for that. I mean, we still deliver the best reliability, quality, no fires, no electrocution, no harm to, uh, to people and to, uh, to goods. But our customers, because it's digital, call us to energy <coughs> optimization, process optimization, predictive maintenance, uh, asset management, which are coming natively as a byproduct of those uh, systems. Now, when you are a company that was selling products with the first characteristics and that you have to go into that form of consulting, think about the whole reconversion that you have to do with your sales force. You don't speak to the same people in, uh, in the company. So that has, that's a very exciting. We've been 20 years in, uh, in the journey, but it's been really creating new value to our company. Can I ask you one follow-up? Um, I spent a lot of time personally working with R&D organizations over the years. And transforming R&D is actually quite a challenge because people are very committed and very smart, but they get very deep skill sets. They're technically deep, and it's hard to get them sometimes to see the world from a different angle. You mean you talk conservative? To, conservative, well, innovative, but, but in the way they know how to do it. You know what I mean? They, they have yeah, a way sure. of doing it. And, and so you talked about now moving to, I think you said 60% R&D is sort of software related, yeah. probably very different skills than the way you traditionally recruited for R&D. How have you made that transition really happen in R&D? And how do you see the, you know, making that work? Well, some people make happily the journey. And actually, they find it very exciting. Second, we have acquired. Uh, third, we have created a venture capital fund that affiliates us with a number of startups and things so that they inspire us and we create things, uh, create things together. On, on the other conclusion, that you, when you have to do big conversion service, you have to, to take people from the outside. But just, just a few words, it changes fundamentally your way to develop products. I mean, in the world of before, you make a spec, you spend two or three years in the tunnel of development. Now, you go fast on the market with a, with a minimum viable product. And then you can upload, download software to bring more functionalities so that you are much faster testing the functionality with a, with a customer and much faster adapting the product to your customer needs. So it's not only changing uh, what you do, but it's a lot about changing the way you do it. Bernard, I've been hearing for years about how uh, Kaiser had been such a leader in integrating IT and bringing different parts of the value chain together in healthcare provision. But of course, digital transformation is hitting this world in a big way too. How do you see your digital transformation priorities now in the context of the enormous leadership role that Kaiser's historically had in sort of the, the IT environment in healthcare? Yeah, uh, great, thanks. And it's uh, really great to be here. Um, with this esteemed panel. Um, it's a great question, and of course, when you talk to me about this, I say, yeah, I would love to talk about it because we're, we're knee-deep in our transformation within, within Kaiser Permanente. Fortunately, we've embraced technology as part of the history of our organization, which has been somewhat unique in the healthcare industry. And so there's almost a natural, but I would tell you the change now with digital transformation is dramatic, uh, even inside of our organization. So right quick, if you think about the healthcare industry, we pretty much have enjoyed the luxury of forcing everybody to come to us for everything that you need. We built the healthcare industry on two legs. One, a fix me system, pretty much. People get sick and then you come to see us. And number two, we designed it around how we wanted to do everything. So it was provider, uh, built and to our convenience in, in many cases. We're deploying a strategy in Kaiser Permanente of what I call care anywhere, that we're challenging that whole notion that people have to come in for everything that they need. And the digital platform has allowed us to both prove that theory as true and to enhance the value that our members see in Kaiser Permanente. Case in point, uh, we introduced uh, e-visits, and we started with the mobile phone and with the computer, mm -hmm. your ability to have a secure office visit with your doctor, with your provider directly. Uh, last year, we did something like 26 million e-visits. Uh, members love it. 
on a scale of one to ten is something like nine point something. Satisfaction extremely high. Additional access into the organization. Never have to leave your home. Never have to leave your office. Never have to leave wherever you are for something that is appropriate that could be taken care of with a virtual visit. We're now building on that uh, telehealth, uh, where now the visual becomes important, in particular between the interaction between the patient and the physician. And so I expect that that's going to take off uh, just like the first generation of what we were doing um, as well. Inside of the organization, it has created both incredible possibilities as well as incredible fears and challenges. All the way from the life of a physician has changed dramatically uh, inside of our organization because now, um, like some of us in the other side of the world, we've been doing this for a long time, always on, uh, and this has been a cultural challenge for some of our providers. Right. The second one is, um, it is true I've come to learn that actually people do pay attention to what the CEO is saying. <laughs> and what, what I have discovered... Big shock. Uh, big shock. And what I have discovered is what I have learned in terms of feedback from the organization is that I'm heavy on the technology. I fully embrace it. I'm building a whole digital platform. I have strategic partners. I'm into it. What I'm hearing back from the organization is what you've excluded from your communication is our role in that mm -hmm. and our role in the future of this organization. And it was an aha moment for me because I just assumed everybody would know that we still need people to take care of people. And I've discovered that people have started to look at is this replacing all of us in theory or is in fact this is helping to enable us <laughs> to be more effective in taking care of millions of people. Wonderful. Meg, um, HPE is at the forefront of many of the technologies we're talking about around the cloud, predictive algorithms, big data and analytics. And how do you see these technologies changing and what it means for companies to really go digital right now? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. This is a, a great privilege to be here. Um, we do have a unique position because we have had to digitally transform a 75-year-old company, just like the organizations many of you run, while at the same time, we are one of the partners that people choose to help them digitally transform. And what's driving this really is two things in my view. It is every one of you is trying to figure out how do you take your organization and make it even more competitive so that you win in the marketplace, whether you're Kaiser or any anyone else over the next five years. The other thing that has changed, which I bet everyone can relate to, is speed. My view is the future belongs to the fast. If you can't get your organization to accelerate at dramatic speed their ability to develop the technology that will allow you to win, almost by definition you are falling behind. The other big change is that business strategy is now completely one and the same with IT strategy. And I thought, Bernard, you said it very well. There is no business strategy with what it, without the IT underpinnings that is going to allow you to win in the marketplace. And virtually every major company has a problem. They have an existing, quite rigid, not very cost-effective, slow, legacy IT environment that's been built up over anywhere from 10 to 50 years. And every organization knows they have to move from where they are to where they must be. And so how do you balance the needs of your existing IT infrastructure that runs your business, runs your supply chain, while at the same time you move to a new environment? And so what um, I think this is driving is organizational change, but perhaps more than that, every CIO, every CEO has to have a plan. And how, where are you today? And in three or four years, where are you going to be? What are the milestones? And what's the business case for getting it done? Because what I also know is there's not usually big incremental budgets for IT spend. In fact, I bet most of you are trying to figure out how to spend less on IT while you move to the new world order. So it's investing in some very basic things like automation and orchestration. You would be surprised how many organizations are not fully automated, not fully orchestrated, and there's a 20 or 30 percent savings off the top right there. Virtualization. Many companies are not fully virtualized. Movement to the cloud. 
some folks have started with very small applications in the cloud. How you get to the cloud as fast as humanly possible, whether on-premise or someone else's cloud, and how you pick the SaaS applications that you're going to drive for your organization. The key to this whole thing is workloads. So you've got maybe 2,700 workloads or applications in your organization. What do you want to keep locked down in your data center, untouched by anyone else except for your employees? What do you want to move to a private cloud on-premise? What would you be willing to move to a managed cloud or a virtual private cloud or a public cloud? And then what applications do you never want to see anything in your environment? You just want to buy that application that lives in the cloud like Salesforce. And that is the whole key to transform, transforming your digital environment is where are the applications going to live? And um, then lastly, and I'm sure we'll talk about this, is there is also a big business model change happening. IT used to be bought on a CapEx basis. Today, increasingly, the world is moving to a consumption model. And so you can move CapEx to OpEx. And then you partner with companies who can actually help you do that. If you're a Salesforce, that's a OpEx model from the beginning. But your, your traditional environment can be bought on a consumption-based model, which for many, many companies makes the ability to finance this digital transformation incredibly important and, and doable. So, and then, of course, there's the thing I think we'll talk about last, which is culture. In many ways, and you think this will be interesting to you running a technology company, the technology is actually the easy part. Getting the organization to move to adopt the new technology and the new way of doing business and the new business models is really in many ways the toughest component. And we have had experience internally at, at HP when we don't manage the process of change as effectively as we manage the technology change, actually the projects are not as successful as they would other, otherwise might be. And for those of you who are technologists like Bernard, you know everyone wants to blame the technologists. <laughs> Often it is the culture change that hasn't had the right attention paid to it. Excellent. So I want to come back exactly to that, but I want to first, Mark, just ask you, you've been working essentially for with many hundreds of companies now around their digital transformation journeys. And just to share your perspective on, you know, where do you see the world moving in terms of the priorities and where companies need to be taking the big bets right now? <clears throat> well, I think, thanks Rich, and thanks for putting together this panel. Uh, you know, number one, I think everybody got this great book from Klaus Schwab, The Fourth Industrial Revolution. And if you haven't had a chance to read that book, I mean, that's, I think, a great place to start and kind of map your comp current company uh, against that. And I think what you'll find when you do that is the fourth industrial revolution starts with one very important point, which is trust. That is, you're about to define a new level of trust between yourself and your employees, between yourself and your customers, between your, yourself and your key stakeholders, shareholders, as Jean Pascal said, between yourself and your partners. And this is a, a cultural uh, revolution for organizations that are not built on trust. Because when we talk about trust, when we talk about growth, when we talk about innovation, we have to talk about it in that order. That's number one. Now, you know, it, it kind of, I was thinking about how do I explain it? And then this morning, of course, I woke up at 5 a.m. because I never sleep in Davos. <laughs> and I went down to the gym. And of course, what do I find? Of course, uh, my friend uh, Nerio, I see him sitting in the back row. Would you just wave to us, Nerio? Is the CEO of Techno Gym, and he, <laughs> is, uh, you know, um, has all this amazing new equipment. And it's all connected now, and I have to put in my information, and, you know, it's a big internet of things, and his bikes are connected, and the elliptical trainers are connected, and the treadmills are connected, and he knows who I am, and he knows how much I'm working out, he's got all my biometrics. And it's not just about um, uh, a B2C situation, because he's also a B2B company. That is, he's selling to the hotels, he's selling to the fitness centers, and he's building this kind of collaborative social network. So it's about uh, mobility, it's about um, collaboration, it's about, of course, the cloud, because now he has a big techno gym cloud. But at the end of the day, I'm only gonna use those bikes, and I'm only gonna register with that network, and I'm only gonna get involved in the area if I trust him. And um, of course, I trust him because I met him here, you know, many years ago. And, uh, and um, but as a customer of his, I better be ready to a new level of trust because 
the types of access, the types of information, the types of data, the level of privacy that we are talking about. It doesn't matter if you're HP or Kaiser or Alcoa or Schneider Electric. All of these companies are going online. All of these companies are connected in a whole new way and they're connected to their customers in a whole new way. They all have incredible stories about how this fourth industrial revolution has transformed them, not only now, but where they see they, where they wanna be 10 years from now. But I guarantee you that in each and every one of these stories, it begins with the transformation of trust in their enterprise. And that's the hard part. Employees better realize uh, customers aren't gonna use your products in the fourth industrial revolution unless they trust you. This is a big change. It's very interesting you said that because this morning I was at a breakfast that Richard Edelman hosts every year mm -hmm. on trust. And the thing that their trust barometer shows <laughs> this year is that the gap between trust of the, I forget what the phrase is, but the more elites and sort of the mass of the population has never been wider than it is right now. And I think some of this is the stories, Bernard, that you were telling or Meg, you were describing about how engaging the broader community, having people deeper in the organization. Rich, this is the, the opportunity for all of us. The opportunity for all of us is to do what Meg said, to get there fat first, get to the future first. But when you get there, make sure that you are show up with the right values. Right. Because the values of the fourth industrial revolution are different than the values of the third revolution. And we all know that, okay? And that's the transformation that we're all gonna make together. And uh, it's very exciting. I mean, it's, there's never been a more exciting time in the history of, of industry. I wanna come back to this. I just wanna pick up on one more point around this digital transformation journey broadly, which is, and for all of you, so you don't all have to jump in, but whoever, uh, how do you know if you're going fast enough? And how do you know how much investment is enough investment? And I think <laughs> everyone would say we need to go fast and we need to invest a lot. I think that's, you know, I think that's pretty, but you know, you're the CEOs, you're getting things brought to you all the time. At least my experience is most are impatient. They wish things were happening faster than they were. How do you judge for yourself? Like what's the pace and are you satisfied, you know, to, to drive in this direction right now? Well, I'll, I'll start on that because not only, as I said, have we transformed Hewlett-Packard, but we do this with hundreds of companies every day. And the key factor, I think, to these successful journeys is having a multi-year plan. That you've got to understand where you are today, what the cost structure is today, and what the limits to your infrastructure are in terms of your business strategy. And then you've got to have a multi-year plan, just like every other project is managed milestones, cost reductions, people in charge, and there has to be an inspection process. And you have to build a multi-year plan based on what you can afford, because you have to save to invest, and then you have to hold your organization accountable for delivering against those milestones. And it's tricky. Every organization is different. If you're in the healthcare business, there's a whole set of regulatory and HIPAA regulations that you have to be mindful of. If you're in the financial services in, uh, area, the regulatory over, um, overhead there is just enormous. But if you do not have a plan, you won't get there incrementally. Mm. And my advice to CEOs is hold your IT accountable, your organization, your business accountable for a plan, and then execute the plan. And you can change it as you go along if new technologies arrive, things like that. But if you do not have a plan, it's that old saying, if you do not have a plan, any road will take you there. If you don't have a destination, any road will take you there. And this is where I see huge cost overruns and disappointment in the delivery for the businesses. I would just build on that. Uh, I know we're not going fast enough, at least I believe that, and I want to hold that to be the truth. Um, you know, I'm working on what I call inside the organization <laughs> that we're increasing what I call the BPMs, the beat per minute, and we're getting better at it. Um, but we're still not at the ideal uh, pace. Secondly, um, our challenge that I think about all the time is um, – I have 50, 70 plus years of legacy systems. And, and so I'm, I'm flying the plane today and, and I can't just turn stuff off. And, and so how do I balance um, what goes away because of all this technology and what in fact is still connected and must be connected to it? I think the second piece is working very hard on what should I not be doing in turning to competent organizations 
to do that on my behalf as part of the integrated strategy. And so that's a big piece of the work that we have going on that is aimed at moving faster, but I don't feel that we're moving fast enough. Well, I, I think a lot depends also on how you judge the own environment, you know, because <coughs> obviously, I mean, having a long, long-term long vision uh, uh, always wins, absolutely always wins. And I think that old Andy Grove's old saying, only the paranoid survives, is probably more true today than it ever was, you know. And, and I mean, in an organization, we're 127 years old, you know. So in that organization, I think, I think the push cannot be strong enough. And the only thing that you have to judge as a CEO, when are you over stretching the system, right? Because then you're losing it and cracks appear, you know. But you basically have to have to try to move them as fast as possible, and it's the fine tuning. When you see, uh, do you see cracks? Do you have to slow down? But I think that pace is absolutely essential. Absolutely essential. If I, if I, it's, uh, your question is a lot of headache, right? Uh, because on one side, you know, you have to invest because well, you figure out that the world will be digital. Uh, on how much money? First, it's expensive. Uh, it's really expensive. It asks for an investment, and that's an investment that you don't do in places that you used to do. So you have really to arbitrate, the first thing. And my, my conclusion, after many years of spending too much money in things that were phantasm rather than reality, is really to, every time they come with, we come, with an elephant project, is to slice it in the minimum trenches and go to the market as fast as possible and test the customer and bring the customer from day one into, a, into the thinking. And frankly, I struggle to do differently. I, we are becoming very um, empirical in, uh, in the way of doing. And I would, I would rebound on what Meg was, was saying. It's, it's people spend a lot of time on technology, but it's a lot about business model. And, uh, and uh, we, that changes the whole um, layout of the business model, and we never spend enough time on the business model especially in an engineering company. It's a lot of religious uh, fights about, uh, about technology, which, is, uh, which don't make sense. I'd make one last observation here, which is you can't always go faster than you think you can. Mm -hmm. um, when I came to HP, HP was in a, a fairly challenging situation. I was the third CEO in as many years. And yet this was an entirely new environment for me. And I was very worried about breaking the company. You know, would I be the one who would actually run the car off the cliff? Looking backward, I could, and we moved very fast, but we could have moved even faster. So I would just encourage everyone to think, let's push the edge of the envelope. Klaus said it well. Let's push until you actually start to see a few things crack at the edge. And, and frankly, I think you underestimate, I underestimated the organization's capability to move fast. And I think that is probably almost true for everyone in this room. Great. Great. So I want to shift a little bit to the culture stuff before we open it up for the room for questions, because it's such a fundamental question, and how do you bring the organization along? I thought the comment that a number of you made in different forms were the technology is tough, but the technology isn't the toughest part. The toughest part is how do you entrust in the organization and with your customers, and how do you bring along your organization? I, I guess I'd like to start, um, Mark and, and uh, Jean Pascal, you, you guys are, are generating so much data now that your customers can, you, you're changing the way people think about data and how you wire the organizations together and leverage that both inside the organization and with your customers. And I, and I think, um, Mark, you made a comment in another setting that the data was almost dark matter inside the, inside the organizations. Uh, what are the unintended consequences, and I don't mean that just in a cybersecurity sense, but the challenges of living in this world of big data and bringing the cultures along to be able to use it in the right ways? Well, I think Jean Pascal, Pascal is a great example, as, uh, uh, as well as the other panelists as well, but I think you look at the incredible transformation that has happened with uh, Schneider Electric. First, you have a company that has acquired all these amazing companies around the world, for any CEO, that's going to be scary right there that you have to create a culture, a common culture, a collaborative culture. And then, number two, a transformational vision that he's going to be able to go to any government agency, to any business, to any consumer, and ultimately get their residents, their office building, their f corporate facilities online, manage them, monitor them, 
do things with sensors that have never been done before. This was aggressive, you know? And then you look at the market share gains that he's achieved against his competitors. It's just relentless execution on a compelling vision. I mean, I look at my own company today, we're the fastest growing software company in the top 10, and I'm fortunate that, you know, all these panelists are also our, our customers, and that we get to work with them. That's our joy every day, is the opportunity to partner with these customers. That's what makes it fun. Um, but when you look at somebody who pushes you, and Jean Pascal pushes, and um, even somebody like me, it's, it, is, it does become scary. And um, that's, that's the first time I use you saying that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to be nice. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I'll tell you that, um, you know, speed is the new currency of business. You know, I have a good friend of mine who's just saying that all the time. You know, the most dangerous place to make a decision uh, is in the office. We have these incredible devices that all of us have here now. And... Um, this makes everything go faster. It, this, is, this is what is making everything go faster because communication is just happening faster and faster. When I first started coming to World Economic Forum in 2002, you know, we used to get these proprietary devices. They didn't work. You know, nothing worked. The network didn't work, whatever. I, th I don't know if it was Joe Schoendorf was running it, but something was <laughs> deeply wrong. And now you just come in here yes, and it's just, I know. everything is like lightning, <laughs> yeah. how yeah. fast it's going, you know? Totally. And, <laughs> well, there is some of that. We did put Salesforce into the World Economic Forum, that helps. But I, I think that, you know, that, that's what's going on. The reality is it's the technology also enables speedier execution. And so in that way, it's kind of a little bit of the medium is the message. That is, we know we have to get more connected. We all, look, I used to come to the World Economic Forum and talk about, well, we're the cloud and you know, we're rateable technology and we're a multi-tenant architecture and we're a subscription service and you know, we're not you know, a capital expense, we're an operating expense. That's all of these companies. What company? It does not want to be a cloud company today. What company does not have a multi-tenant architecture? What, what company doesn't want to move to that uh, same business model that we have? And that's kind of what's cool for us. And um, that, that's also what's fun. But how we grew our business was speed. You just cannot go fast enough. And um, because if you're not going fast enough, somebody else is. And that's why we all have to be a little bit scared and we all have to go a little bit faster. Jean-Pascal, did you want to add anything? Uh, I can give the, the, other, the other picture on the other side of, uh, of the mirror. But uh, we were facing the issues that Mark described very well. Lots of acquisitions. We're operating as a federation of separate companies. And customers were harshly complaining. We want one solution. We want one Schneider. And any kind of traditional IT program in, uh, in this dimension was, was in incredible cost, long time of deployment, time was actually more important. Anyway, met them, uh, it was pretty much at the beginning, great solution, first reaction, what? Put our customer data on the cloud in San Francisco <laughs> over my dead body, okay? So, but, but then we went into it, deployed it in one year. So suddenly you've got one repository for the customers, 360 degrees on uh, your customers, your call centers, your people on the ground, uh, mob uh, equipped with mobility and able to do that. It's been great for us. And it's been a part of the evolution of the culture. Next day, everybody has the same visibility on the same customer. And, and the trust issue is behind us now. So now it's about building together new functionalities, which we did uh, one, one year ago. Mm -hmm. We went to the next level. Meg, you know, we were talking before of this. You're also seeing this, how do you help bring different parts of the organization together and sometimes take them apart and sort of build the organization through the IT, and, but also bringing the people along. I don't know how you yeah. would see this in the context of culture and strengthening organizations. Well, as I said before, and I think has been echoed by the panel, speed is so important. I really do believe that the future belongs to the fast. And uh, so how you transform your organization, I have a couple of thoughts on it. One is, and this will sound like motherhood and apple pie, but you would be surprised how often people don't do this. The right people, in the right job, at the right time, with the right attitude. 
And depending, you know, turnarounds, transformations are not for everybody. And so you've got to look all the way down your organization. Do you actually have the people in the organization in the right job who can help you accomplish this? No amount of pressure from the top with the wrong people will bring you home. And so we've done a huge change out of people um, because we had to have the right skill set, the right attitudes, frankly, the right constitution to do this. The second thing I would say is communications, communications, communications. I feel like, I, probably some of you know I ran for governor of California. Often I feel like I'm giving a stump speech <laughs> at, uh, at HP because we say the same thing over and over and over again. And you would be surprised after you've said it 57 times, people say, I never knew you thought that. I mean, it's amazing. And, uh, and when you are communicating with large groups of people, it is actually not the facts and the figures. It is the stories that you tell. No one remembers the facts and the figures. They remember the stories that you, that you tell. And that's part of the way we're driving culture change. And then the last element of this is I fully believe that you do not get what you do not inspect. You do not get what you do not inspect. And so you've got to set your organization up in a way that the results and the processes and the milestones get inspected. And then corrective action is taken early, because I totally agree with Jean Pascal. You can find yourself a year into something, and if you haven't been inspecting it on a weekly basis, the thing is wholly off track, and you have lost massive amount of time, and frankly, a fair amount of credibility with your organization. So it's not, people say, you know, you don't get what you don't expect. It doesn't sound uplifting. But it is because you're making progress that then you can tell the organization about. And it shows the organization what you care about, too. Just exactly. the act of tracking things is a signal. This one matters to me. Yep. And so I fully agree. And then last but not least, of course, is a set of shared values and beliefs. And I think most great historic companies have real DNA that they can build from. I'm very fond of saying that actually founder DNA, Mark will be happy to hear this, founder DNA is very hard to kill. And in most cases, <laughs> And in Mark's case, that's a really good thing. Um, They're trying, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> You're so right. You know, BCG's the founder left the firm in 1980. It's 35, now 36 years later. It is still so much yeah. ingrained in the yeah. way we think and talk. It's a very, Listen, very good uh, point. Listen, Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard have been gone from the company for 30 years. And when I came to the company, I, I could feel the DNA. I could see it. I could smell it. And I said, let's do more of what we do well and then make the to-do list as opposed to let's find all the things that are wrong. And uh, that was a winning formula. I'm conscious I want to get to questions, but I'm just really interested. Bernard and Klaus, you have frontline employees that are you know, in businesses that are very traditional ways of operating over many years. And if you could just both quickly talk about the cultural aspects of making these changes happen and really getting it to seep into the organization, I think it'd be really valuable. Just uh, two quick comments. The first one is, um, one of the things that certainly I'm learning in my role as CEO of a, of a great organization is the cultural change is about me also. Uh, I remember a long time ago someone told me uh, a leader without a follower is just a person taking a walk. <laughs> and, um, and so I want to make sure that there are people with me uh, on this journey. And so that means that I have to figure out tapping into their value system, how to engage them in the change process as well. The second thing is, to Mark's point, and I haven't read the book yet, but I will. Um, in our industry and in our organization, our physicians and nurses is, for me, a great example of what happens when you have a trusting relationship. And at the center of that trust is the physician culture, the nursing culture, is that I'm here to take care of the patient. I'm the advocate of the patient. I have the best interest of the patient at heart. And it's very important to me that as we make the cultural and technology changes, that we keep that centerpiece there. And so their voice is very important to the credibility of what we come up with that's going to maintain, if not enhance, the trusting relationship that we want to have with now almost 11 million people. And our business is not a transactional business. It's a business of relationships and building on trust. 
Um, well, I think that what Max said, the founder spirit, for a company that's old, I mean, it's also an advantage. What what I've done is, I mean, we, we have a great history. I mean, we have a rebel rouser who founded uh, Alcoa. It was this young kid in his early 20s going against the steel robber barons, basically, right, <laughs> with, a, with a material that nobody knew how to make it, right? So to connect it and say, wow, this is our history. We got this disruptive gene. We got to live up to this. You know, if this kid wouldn't have done this, we would all not have a job. We wouldn't have lived. So it is, it's very strong. That's the first thing. The second thing, I mean, it's all about people. I, I totally agree. So it's tone from the top still is very important. It still is very important. I mean, we've, we've used this thing, I mean, be a more Schumpeter, or I've coined this thing, think louder, act faster, right? So, so, but then the third thing, which is something that only dawned on me by having seen this, I think there is an advantage of bringing established knowledge. You can constantly refresh it with no established knowledge together, right? And if you can master this, and this is not something the organization can do by design. I'll give you the example. I, we, we have a very good internship program. We're currently making it better. But if you were to say, hey, you, you now define exactly who we are recruiting as an intern. Some good things that we've seen in the last years would have never happened. So I run into, going into a plant, I run into a kid who does an internship there. And he, they gave him a little space and uh, trying out stuff. He's working with microphones, with microphones and listening to a pouring process, a pouring process. And I'm thinking, what on earth is this kid doing? And I'm, I'm stopping, you know, and, and uh, I, asked, I asked him. He's African-American. In fact, he's African originally, you know, Michigan University. And he says, well, I worked, I, I worked in the automotive. I worked in Michigan University a little bit on the automotive. And for automotive, all, uh, acoustics are very important. And, and every material talks to you. I said, wow, every material talk. We never thought about this, you know? <laughs> so what does this material tell you? And he says, well, you know, we have this problem. I don't want to go into too much depth, you know? But it's a very expensive problem because we never diagnose it. It happens, it happens at the early part of the process, and we only find it in the later part of the process. So in the meantime, a lot of value add gets lost, you know? And he says, well, I think it happens because something cracks in this, right? And I can listen to the material, and I can hear whether it cracks. You know, so, so I said, oh, wow, let me see this. And he shows me this. He has an oscillogram. I mean, he probably had spent no more than $200 on this, you know. So he, tr he listens to it, and you can hear, you know, suddenly the oscillogram goes up. Now he knows it's cracked. And I said, no, now what? He says, now I know it cracked, you know. Now I can take this, and now we go into a digital radiography, which has moved on, and I can do a 3D digital radiography on this piece. Now I can install that in the line as constant quality inspection. That's an idea that nobody would have come up with. So that's why, why I think you have to allow, you know, to get some fresh talent in that has this naivety or some totally different backgrounds. And if this comes together with established know-how, that something really cool can evolve from this. Thank awesome. you. And thanks for the University of Michigan plug. <laughs> Great to hear. Uh, we have time for a couple questions. Uh, Joe? I think the microphone. Let me and we'll need it. to keep our answers quick so we can get a couple in before. Joe we Schoendorf, the Venture Capital, 50 years in Silicon Valley, started working for HP 50 years ago. Computers in those days were IBM, Snow White, and the Seven Dwarfs. <laughs> the Seven Dwarfs are all gone. IBM is in pretty different business. This is my 20th Davos. I looked last night, top 10 most valuable companies in the world. Five of them are in high tech. Let's take them. Apple. Alphabet, Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon. When I came here 20 years ago, I looked it up. Jeff Bezos was one year in having Amazon online. Yeah. Gil Emilio was still running Apple, and they were close to bankruptcy. Mark Zuckerberg was 10 years old. Larry Page was still at Stanford, and Microsoft had just had its first $2 billion quarter, and he was still working at Oracle two years away from starting Salesforce, and the transformation of the cloud, Larry Ellison is still trying to figure it out, and you've got one of the world leaders sitting right over here. My, my real theory is, and it's what venture capital is all about, big transformation happens because the big companies don't get it right, and a startup comes in and runs at faster than anybody can and builds a new industry. End of story. Any reactions, particularly from the very strong legacy companies that are sitting up here? 
I totally agree. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I agree, right? It's Darwinism. And so Absolutely. we all have a responsibility to continue to make our companies relevant and reinvent because, you know, listen, the, the whole world has changed. And if you do not reinvent, you'll be eclipsed. And it's a challenge for the big companies and the older companies. The other challenge, at least in my situation, is a lot of people inside of my company, and me included, would consider us very successful. And so the question is always this tension of how much change are we trying to produce when we're getting all these positive results already? So that becomes an ongoing challenge for how you keep the organization fresh and moving forward. The, the innovative companies that right now are coming into the healthcare arena, I view as a, fresh, a, a breath of fresh air because they're forcing us to think very differently and to see on the horizon what's possible. Great. Others? Toshi, maybe one last question. I have a question about what is critically different from third uh, industry revolution to fourth industry revolution. We heard about speed and also communication and culture and value. It all seems to be the same. But Mark, you mentioned about there's a value that will be totally different from the fourth and third. I'd like to ask you, what is critically different? What do you think we should do totally differently from the past? Hmm. Well, I think that, uh, you know, I mentioned trust. I mean, I think that's a big, the big one because when everything is connected, things are going to go badly wrong. And uh, there's a lot of good examples of that. I don't know how many of people in the, this room have read uh, the book uh, uh, Ghost Fleet yet, but it's one that I would highly recommend. And it's about everything getting connected for the, the militaries of the world. And uh, you, you, you're about to enter an environment, which is what this book so beautifully lays out, that's kind of unprecedented, that you have lots of really powerful technology, some information technologies, some biotechnologies, um, manufacturing technologies, and uh, all these things are kind of coming together at once, which is really unusual, and it's going to transform all of our uh, industries. And I think that looking back at our earliest days, um, I was coming out of the third in industrial revolution. I was coming out of a third industrial revolution company, Oracle, looking into the fourth industrial revolution. And when we first had a reliability uh, crisis at Salesforce, I didn't know what to do. You know, I was kind of acting how I was acting at Oracle, which is, well, you just don't say anything. You just hold on and we'll get through this. <laughs> Instead, um, we had to move to a transparency-based organization, a transparency culture. We built trust through transparency. We had to put up a web page, trust.salesforce.com. We had to disclose everything. We had to see that our customers and our partners were rooting for us to be successful. And they were part of our team. That was very different. So I think that we will be guided by a different set of uh, values. And I think the faster that we move on to those values, the more successful we'll be, the faster we will get there. And uh, this, this is going to be an amazing new world. I did, I did want to mention that just before I walked in, I got a, a note from Klaus Schwab on this. And he asked for Bernard to stand up during this. So Bernard, would you just stand up? And evidently, it's Bernard's birthday today. And ah. Klaus asked us to sing happy birthday to Bernard. So happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Bernard. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> okay, so let me, I, time is short and we want to keep everyone on schedule. I'm going to ask the panelist one quick question, but it's, a, it's an important one, which is the world is changing quite fast. Could you, could you give an example of what do you think is the big bet that stands out for you that you think three years ago, had you been sitting on the stage, you wouldn't have even been thinking about it, wouldn't have been on your radar screen, mm. and now it's pretty fundamental to the way you think about your future. Mark? Well, I think the big bet that you know, we had to uh, go through that's um, really transformed us as an organization is to be much more focused on industries. Um, you know, when we're partnering with high technology, with right. healthcare, with manufacturing, you know, with uh, uh, electronics, um, or everyone in this room, we, we had to make a pretty big shift internally. And once we made that decision, uh, we had to go uh, all in. Great. Jean Pascal. 
Um, probably two things. First, uh, we have several poles of digitization, customer relationship, connectivity of products, supply chain, the way we work together, the need to integrate them because it's rotating fast and you need to connect everything together with the rest. So it's just like a need for consistency, which is a... And, and really, uh, you are speaking about the new values of this. I don't know if we call it the force and things, but uh, being really sharp on uh, where you want to make a difference and really be very sharp on the partners you want to associate with. Um, that would right. be the importance of speed. I mean, not that it wasn't on my radar, but as we, we are now, uh, we've decided to separate the company so that both entities have their unique profile uh, and the speed in which we have to do this and we have to continue to, to speed is everything. I think our big bet was um, a, a great fear that we would open up all this new uh, opportunity for access and demand and that it will get used unnecessarily. Uh, and what we have discovered is people are smart and they don't want to spend all their time with us, but for the right things they want to come to us and we have figured out how to manage all this new demand. Excellent. Meg? Um, like Klaus, separation. We had to get smaller to get bigger, to get faster and, and smarter. And so separating a $110 billion company with 300,000 employees would not have crossed my mind three years ago. And, this, and the other one is um, lean into completely disruptive innovation. We're trying to reinvent compute with the machine. Excellent. So I'd like to close by thanking this outstanding panel. Um, I, I'd like to just highlight, we heard so many great things, we don't have time to recap, but this point that technology is not the hardest part, it's how you think about all the things around the technology, the human beings, the organization, the way you make it work, the repeated emphasis of speed and adaptiveness and agility, but particularly speed to move at a pace that is beyond the normal comfort zone to drive things forward, that a strong business model, a robust plan is really the foundation for pushing forward the essential elements of trust and, and how much earning trust with your customers and deep in your organization is key to drive this. And lastly, one of my favorites was a point that Bernard had made a few minutes ago, which is complacency is the enemy here. These are all leaders of very successful companies. They've come in at different points in time, some were different challenges, but, but, the, but a lot of what's required here requires cutting against the grain and the mindset of highly successful organizations and really resisting the natural temptations to complacency. Thank you all so much for joining us. It was wonderful to have you. Thank you.